say more application oriented, uh, but first with a bit of a detour through so, say deep learning techniques uh, presented by Tuguri from IBM. Hello everybody, I'm Shay Kuri. I work for IBM Systems Lab Services. So what can lab services do for this community, serious academic researchers? Well, in one sentence, we will let you focus on your research. <laughs> so we'll do the installations, we'll take care of the infrastructure design and development. We can do POCs and demonstrate the value of our software products, IBM software products for your particular research. And we do understand your research. And in my case, I have a background in computer science. Uh, I did SPIR work. I was a principal investigator on quite a few SPIR projects. I collaborated with national labs and universities. So you don't have to spend a week to bring up the speed and help us understand your research. We will understand your research and quickly add value to, to your computing environments. So I'm going to talk about a few things. I'll talk about a couple of use cases that we uh, we, I'm not a full-time researcher. I do the infrastructure designing, I do POCs, uh, I do workshops, etc. Uh, training, <coughs> machine learning and deep learning training, etc. But uh, I work with the researchers at Dalhousie University and enable their use cases on our platform. So I talk about uh, peripherally uh, about their use cases. And um, I will demonstrate the Jupyter notebooks, I have a DNA sequencing, pretty toy example. It's, it's a toy example, DNA sequencing on power. And, uh, and uh, we'll talk about our flagship product for machine learning and deep learning, the Power AI. Uh, at, a, at a high level, the features of Power AI and, uh, and machine learning at scale, the traditional machine learning at scale. So here is the context. IBM has set up a high-performance computing cluster at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Canada. It has about uh, 30, it has 34 nodes, and uh, 10 of them have uh, GPUs, two Pascal 100 GPUs each. And there are 20 nodes with 512 gigabytes of memory, and there are four nodes with one terabyte of memory, and there's 2,500 terabytes of storage. And uh, the researchers are using this platform for a variety of scientific fields, including bioinformatics, ocean engineering, sentiment analysis, uh, genome sequencing, text mining, etc. <coughs> so this is the first use case we worked on. But it's still being investigated, but it's just the use case. The North Atlantic right whale is considered as a highly endangered species by both U.S. and Canadian governments. And uh, <coughs> there are fewer than 500 Atlantic right whales that are alive, and as many as 17 whales died last summer. So there is a lot of pressure on the researchers to understand the cause for the death <coughs> of the whales, whether it is because of the collisions with the ships. Okay. And uh, the NOAA, National Oceanic Administration, Atmospheric Administration has created a Kaggle competition for detecting whales. So some of you might have seen the NVIDIA images and the demos for uh, whale detection. <coughs> so the way it's being investigated is the acoustics sensors are installed in the oceanic waters. And then marine biologists manually <coughs> listen to these sounds and classify them as whale sound or not a whale sound. And there is a lot of ambient noise in the ocean, the sound from the waves, the, uh, the ship sirens, etc. <laughs> right? So uh, it needs a skilled expert to manually listen to those sounds. And uh, sometimes it takes uh, a series of sounds. They need to listen to a series of sounds to be able to uh, identify whale sounds. So at the end of the day, maybe a fun fact, just for the sake of fun, let's see if we can play this whale sound. If not, you can always just find the sound off. Yeah. The, the remote the TV sound. The TV sound. Maybe. Oh, yeah, we have to. Yeah, it's a <laughs> Goes on for 30 
acoustic files are converted into a frequency domain and uh, CNNs are being investigated. LSTMs are also being investigated because sometimes it takes uh, uh, a series of sounds to listen to a it, it requires the expert to listen to a series of sounds. <coughs> and once the wave classification is done, the idea is to cross it with the AIS database and then develop wave conservation strategies collision, ship collision detection and wave conservation strategies on top of it. <coughs> so what is AIS data? We, uh, that's the next use case. But that's the infrastructure case, but uh, we look into it. It, it, it. Essentially, AIS data provides the ship location and trajectory information. <coughs> so AIS, the automatic identification system, it's an automatic uh, tracking system used on ships. Each ship is equipped with an AIS transponder and uh, all the ships that are weighing more than 300 tons are mandated to transmit the AIS data. <coughs> and the traditional AIS data existed since, since quite a while, but the satellite AIS data has uh, come to picture since 2011. So we have about seven years of uh, satellite AIS data. And there's a lot of interest from the researchers because it has a lot of potential for machine learning and deep learning applications. The, our customer is tasked with maintaining this AIS database and provide it to the researchers. <coughs> this is the infrastructure we designed. Uh, the researchers were, the AIS data was hosted on a Postgres database. And uh, it was both compute and memory intensive, so the researchers were not able to retrieve the data as fast as they could. So we moved that onto a power platform. Uh, we have an IBM ESS storage, which provides as much as 2,500 terabytes of uh, storage. And then we proposed using GPU databases. All these GPU databases are available on power, MapD, Kinetica, and uh, uh, and Postgres has a GPU plugin called PostStrong. Right. MapD is single node, it's free for single node. And Kinetica is licensed, but it's distributed. <coughs> and uh, we can accommodate both the uh, traditional MPI based applications and also the Spark, up, Spark based applications <coughs> on the same uh, compute infrastructure. So we facilitate both the analytics, the database analytics used based on GPU databases, the MPI applications and Spark applications on the same compute within the same compute environment. <coughs> These are few other uh, machine learning applications that are based on AIS data. One thing with the uh, with the AIS data is it can be easily manipulated. The, a ship can easily disguise itself by changing the configuration of the AIS transponder. So it's called false ship effect. Detecting the false ship effect is one uh, use case. The vessel classification, for example, cargo ships move slower than the, uh, <coughs> than the fishing ships. And uh, anomaly detection, illegal fishing activity, etc. These are all the investigative cases, the deep learning use cases that are being investigated. The forward prediction is predicting the movement of the ship. And uh, for anomaly detection, the traditional methods use first off based, uh, first off distance based techniques. They used to uh, find anomalies by matching the distance to the existing trajectories to find anomaly in the trajectory of the ship. So, and they're investigating deep learning use cases for that. So that's all I have about the uh, ocean engineering use cases. 
The next thing I want to do is demonstrate a Jupyter notebook <coughs> with the Power 9, Power 8 platform. Sorry, it's Power 9. I'm bringing up the Python notebook here. I'm sorry if I'm going, if I'm preaching to the choir and if it is too basic, I don't know how familiar you are with Python notebooks. Maybe you are. So which system you are connecting to? It's a, it's a Power9 in our lab. But we do have a uh, Power9 platform at Oregon State University that's available for uh, open power enthusiasts. So if you're interested in using that platform, please let us know. And we can create an account for you, and uh, you can play with it. You will have access to IBM Power AI, the Enterprise Edition. Is it Enterprise? Or? It is Enterprise Edition. And we also, you will also have access to H2O and H2O driverless AI. And I'll demonstrate uh, driverless AI in a moment. By the way, those are also, we, we support Power 9, AC922s here on the in the Vix cloud. cloud. They're available now. Also, H2O, Power AI, distributed Power AI, mm -hmm. Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Notebook. So I usually call these as fourth generation programming tools because when I, when I went to school, I used command line, and then there was these GUI based environments. Visual Studio and Eclipse. And then this is a web interface where we can write code, visualize the results, and do everything in the web interface itself. I call them fourth generation because they used to be punch cards. I know I don't know how they look like. I did not work with them. I'm not that old. What was the comment? Thanks a lot. <laughs> But I am old, but I am not that old. <laughs> so this is uh, a simple uh, DNA sequencing example problem based on convolutional neural nets. So it's based on Keras, <coughs> TensorFlow, and Keras. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean Keras is just another abstraction on top of TensorFlow. And uh, the downside is we lose the flexibility, but the upside is we have a lot of uh, ready-to-build functions. But these days, I mean, TensorFlow and Keras, it's please. Make the text a little bigger. Text will zoom in on your window. Cool. Yeah. Okay, this is a Keras example, right? So I'll quickly walk through this code. This is just loading the libraries. And <clears throat> here we are downloading a data set. And each, there are about 25,000 DNA sequences. Each sequence is about 100 characters long. And all these are nucleotides, so they are positive examples. <clears throat> so it's a sample sequence. It's 100 characters in length. And we have 28,000 samples. And we do one hot encoding. Well, it's an open source example, toy example that I pulled from GitHub. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it has, uh, because there are 100 characters, and we do one hot encoding, so the matrix size is 100 by 4 for each sequence. And these are positive examples. So we randomly shuffle each sequence to generate negative examples. So 
this generates another 28,000 negative examples here. positive examples, we generate negative examples. Now we have a data set to do supervised learning, create a convolutional neural net, and then do the classification. So it's a simple 2D convolutional neural net. The filter size is 12 by 4, right? So 12 rows, we are doing convolution across, 2D convolution across 12 rows of the matrix. The matrix size is 100 rows. So we have a convolution filter. Uh, it's 12 rows in length and four, uh, four columns in it. And then there are 16 filters. Then there is a cooling step, a max cooling. We flatten it. And then there are two dense layers following it. This <coughs> should be quick. We just create it. And then we divide it into training set and testing set. So it's 80% training set, dividing the data set into 80%, uh, dividing, well, making 80% of the data set into training set and using the remaining 20% for testing. So we have about 26,000 samples, right, positive samples. We created another 26,000 negative samples. So altogether there are 50, roughly 56,000 samples. And 45,000 roughly are being used for training, and 11,000 are being used for testing. And here is where we are training the model. The batch size is 10. I'll reduce the epox to 5 so that we can quickly do the demonstration. I mean, this is longer, 5 epox is longer. But uh, the following steps, here we are doing some prediction, and the area under the curve is 98.98, which is pretty good. <coughs> Let's see if the GPUs are taking. Should be taking in. Should be able to. I just saw 12 percent usage of the GPUs. But anyways, uh, in the interest of time, the next step is to do a motif plot. So for each character in the sequence, we replace that character and then calculate an influence factor for the character. Okay. So for the first five characters, if we plot that influence, here we can see these characters here are the most influential in that particular sequence. So that's the demonstration using Jupyter Notebooks. Like, uh, like we said, if you are interested in playing with Jupyter Notebooks or playing with, uh, let me quickly show the driverless AI. <coughs> so H2O is the open source software, uh, along with the other ones, the XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, and H2O is also becoming a popular open source software for traditional machine learning. 
and they have a product called driverless AI. There is this notion of automatic machine learning that's picking up and HU, IBM has AI vision and uh, IBM has also another tool called NewNet S which can automatically choose a neural network, the number of layers, the number of neurons in each layer and uh, tune the hyperparameters. Uh, H2O, driverless AI and this data robot. So there are a few of these tools that can do automatic machine learning and uh, IBM has a partnership with H2O driverless AI and it's available for uh, for you on the Oregon State Open Power Platform. Okay. <clears throat> so what does driverless AI bring? It gives the uh, it gives the expertise of the Kaggle Grandmaster through a simple graphical interface. It may not be suitable for real deep machine learning and deep learning problems that require the expertise. But for simple classification tasks and regression tasks using the uh, traditional techniques like uh, generalized linear models or for gradient boosting and, and for ensembling especially because it, it picks uh, different kinds of uh, machine learning tools based on the uh, based on these knobs here. So there is a trade-off that can be made between accuracy, the time you want to spend on training and interpretability. We are noticing that interpretability in machine learning is also becoming very important, especially in fields like regulated fields like finance and healthcare. Neural networks, in all their glory, uh, are opaque and, uh, and not easily understood. So, in contrast, the GLMs are uh, are easily interpretable, at least the linear regression models. So, <coughs> this HO driverless AI enables the user to to choose a trade-off between to to, uh, to trade-off between accuracy and interpretability. <coughs> okay, so here we can uh, upload a simple data set from the from the it's a Kaggle data set, Amazon reviews, <coughs> and I'm just loading it from my local host from my uh, from my MacBook here. See, I close this and just show off the file that I have already loaded. And if we look at the file, all it has is this product ID, user ID, the, uh, the score that the reviewer has given for each Amazon product, the text describing the product. And there are a few other things that are not of much use to predict the score. So, <coughs> We can simply use this GUI to, to visualize the data. That's the first step, step in machine learning, right? Understanding the data, visualizing it through correlation plots or, uh, or uh, <coughs> histograms, etc. So this is a radar plot. I think correlation plot would be interesting. And this is also running on power nine. <coughs> Okay, anyways, it will automatically pick, uh, depending on how much accuracy we choose and how much interpretability we want, it automatically picks the uh, machine learning models. It could be logistic, if we choose classification, it could pick logistic regression, maybe random forests or gradient boosting. Uh, it doesn't have neural networks yet, but uh, I think they are underway too. <coughs> and. Uh, it also lets uh, interpret the models that are uh, that have been developed. So decision trees, well, it could be using some other method, but it enforces a decision tree, and that's where it, that's one way to do the interpretation. And uh, the uh, line technique, local interpretable model agnostic interpretation. So it uses a few. It, it shows a. It provides a few interpretable techniques. It, it enables uh, interpretability to some extent. And the next thing I want to do is briefly talk about the Power AI platform. We have a few minutes. So.
So this, our AI is our flagship product for machine learning and deep learning at scale. Okay. There are mainly two trends that we are noticing in the industry and also in the academia. First, there is an interest, there is an increasingly interest, there is an increasing interest in machine learning and deep learning from the academic groups as well as the uh, research and development teams in the industry. And uh, open source is being increasingly embraced by always by the academia and, uh, uh, and recently by the industry. And IBM is firmly in the open source world and it is both a consumer and contributor to the open source community. And uh, the other trend that we are noticing in the industry is the machine learning and deep learning models are increasingly moving into production. There's a lot of training that needs to be done, but there is an increased focus in production and deployment uh, in cloud or, uh, or on the edge, etc. So this is how it started off. Uh, we wanted to, the first uh, the first purpose is ease of use on power use of use of all these machine learning frameworks on power TensorFlow, Cafe, PyTorch, and uh, and there is another uh, set of open source frameworks like R Studio and XGBoost, H2O. Uh, and the MLA from the traditional uh, Spark and Hadoop ecosystem. <coughs> and uh, the idea behind Power AI initially was to provide all of these uh, readily available, make all of these frameworks, the most popular ones, readily available on Power platforms. And that is still the spirit, but it is evolving into an easy to use tool by data scientists. So on top of these open source frameworks, there is a uh, ever-growing set of features that makes the life of a data scientist easy. <coughs> so these are, I mean, we use different names like DL Insight, DDL, SnapML, whatever, but from a conceptual point, these are the main features. Right? First is traditional machine learning at scale. It's called SnapML. So the traditional machine learning algorithms use, well, maybe stochastic gradient descent, or uh, the stochastic coordinate descent. In fact, most of the frameworks like scikit-learn and uh, uh, H2O use uh, stochastic coordinate descent. And the problem with stochastic coordinate descent is inherently sequential. So IBM Research has uh, developed an algorithm called TPASCD, whatever the acronym is, twice parallel asynchronous stochastic coordinate descent. And uh, it's been uh, published widely in uh, NIPS and few other uh, top AI conferences. So <clears throat> we can enable machine learning at scale on GPUs using state-of-the-art algorithms. And, uh, and very good results have been demonstrated for uh, uh, terabytes of training data sets. <clears throat> the other one, the other feature is hyperparameter search. So deep learning algorithms have some Sometimes, I mean, the state of the art, state of the art algorithms have about 50 hyperparameters, so it's a lot of grunt work. And there are a few search algorithms to optimal to choose the optimal combination of hyperparameters. So we support three different search algorithms. These are traditional algorithms. These are developed algorithms from the academia: the random search, the Asian search, and TPE search. And again, the problem with these algorithms are they are sequential. But whatever parallelism there is, we can uh, we, we launch multiple jobs on a Spark cluster <coughs> and parallelize this hyperparameter search. We have something called distributed deep learning, so we can we enable deep learning at scale. If the batch size doesn't fit in a single GPU, we can distribute it among multiple GPUs on multiple nodes. And uh, the traditional parallelization in terms of flow uses parameter server. So it gets all the gradients to one parameter server and then distributes them back. In contrast, uh, IBM Research has developed a ring-based communication mechanism, and we have demonstrated linear scaling to as many as 256 GPUs. So using DDL, uh, I think the next chart has eclipsed. Yeah. So ResNet has been trained by Microsoft for 16 days, and IBM used 64 systems and four GPUs each, so that's 256 GPUs, and we demonstrated linear scaling, so the time came down to seven hours. 
large model support is another feature. Essentially, there are two kinds of parallelism in deep learning, right? data parallelism and uh, model-based parallelism. So for data parallelism, we can use DDL, and model-based parallelism is hard. It's, it's hard to implement. Uh, <coughs> so as GPUs, the GPUs are constrained for memory, right? 16 gigabytes and state-of-the-art have 32 gigabytes. That's still not sufficient because they need to hold the model and also the batch size, right? the entire batch used for training. And there is uh, activation memory. So as models become bigger and as the complexity grows, that might become a constraint. Right? So what we do is we treat the CPU memory. We, we treat the GPU memory as a cache, and we can cache, it, cache the model from the, uh, from the CPU memory to the GPU memory. Okay. <coughs> So IBM, again, IBM Research has developed some effective swap in swap out techniques to be able to effectively stream that part of the neural net that is needed for training. Handling multiple training jobs concurrently, so that's about multi-tenancy. Suppose uh, there are multiple data scientist teams or there are multiple research teams accessing the same cluster, then we can schedule the GPUs without killing the jobs. We can adjust the uh, GPUs, allocate the GPUs dynamically without killing training jobs. <laughs> the data preparation tools and visualization tools. So the, the message is there are a lot of tools that are uh, that are being built on top of these open source frameworks, and that really makes uh, deep learning jobs easier. And you can uh, leverage the advanced techniques. You can you can. And this is a challenge to the academic community to leverage the deep distributed deep learning to come up with these large models. I think the latest ResNet has about 1,500 layers. So the models are going to grow and grow. And we are, uh, we are facilitating that uh, environment. Okay. So that's all I have.